welcome everybody to episode seven of the Bootcast. I'm Eugene Devereaux from irishbootstrapper.com and today I'm joined by Mark Patterson attempting a magnificent feat, the Seven Summits. So Mark, take it away, please introduce yourself. Hey, how are you doing, Alias? And first of all, thank you very much for having me on the pod number seven. It must be magical because I'm actually on my, my seven summit uh of of this this big long journey that i've had now for for quite some time now yeah and uh so you know it's just good fortune the luck of the irish the whole thing is, is <laughs> seems to be going in my way but uh you know yeah so essentially you know i'm a guy who grew up in in uh, in the states in seattle washington for those of you who've never been to seattle washington um it's a very mountainous community uh, mount rainier is anchored up there 14,500 feet and um, spent a lot of time with my parents, my dad in particular, climbing small stuff. Um, fast forward the clock, kind of my passion growing up was playing American football. I know you call football in Europe, you know, more soccer, you know, on that end. But uh, it seemed like I was really born with that ball in my hand. Um, I was able to get a scholarship to the University of Washington. Um, things went well there for me and then uh, ultimately drafted uh, by the, the, uh, the Oakland Raiders. So uh, played a number of years in, in, in the NFL and uh, continued to work out. And, uh, you know, when I got, I got done playing, I did what a lot of guys do is get married, have kids, have a family, and, and go on in that direction. And then about 70 years ago, I was going through a, a rough patch in my life. My dad had died from a massive stroke. And my wife, uh, who we were married for 24 years, no longer want to be married. And so I was, you know, just... I was in a down spot and I needed to clear my mind. And so um, when I started to kind of reemerge out a little bit, I decided to put a BHAG out there. And for those who don't know what that is, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And so that's what I did. I put a big ass goal and did some research. And what I found was that no uh, NFL player had ever climbed the seven summit. So I said to myself, I'm going to be that guy. And so off I went to Tanzania, not knowing how this whole thing would play, but just really focused on the, f- the first mountain, uh, climb Kilimanjaro. Um, and fast forward the clock, I sit here today and just an amazing amount of incredible things I never thought would happen beyond climbing have, uh, have happened for me and very grateful for that. Very good. That's a, that's a nice introduction to kind of show where you've come from, what you're doing now. And uh, the the background to to all of this. Um, so I suppose so. You mentioned before that you played football. So can, can you talk a little bit about that in in the in the NFL? Yeah. So the NFL, you know, is the National Football League, and in, in America, it's the biggest, uh, baddest sport on the block. You know, that's where all the crowds come. They get the highest ratings. It's a nine billion dollar industry now. Thirty two teams, and. Um, you know, it was just fascinating to to be, you know, able to to play. I was never a star in the NFL, but, you know, all teams have first string and second string and everybody has a role in what you do. And I certainly had mine. And, and you know, I guess it really doesn't matter at the end of the day if I was a star or not. The bottom line, um, I'm in the club. And um, I still have those relationships today. And I think, um, you know, through my football experience, both to the NFL uh, professionally, it really taught me a lot about, about mindset and grit and overcoming um, things and pain is temporary. And it, it's really served me well today in the mountains. Uh, every mountain I've been on now, I've been on six of the seven, I've actually climbed. And, um, you know, every single time something has happened. Uh, we've had guys with frostbite. We've had guys falling crevasses. We've had avalanches. Um, we've had people just lay down and quit and you have to be prepared for those things when they come up. And so, um, um, you know, again, going back to my football days, it's really been a benefit for me to help really tap back into that mindset and really help propel me uh, forward in that way. So very blessed. And, you know, the other thing that's been really interesting is that with, um, with all my, my mountain climbing, and I started some uh, social networks, I didn't invent them, but I, you know, I joined, I started a Facebook fan page and Twitter and stuff like that. And today now, my audience is over 350,000, and my NFL days have become relevant again 
I'm doing some work with the NFL and other places like that, that, um, you know, it's pretty cool to go back and hang out with those guys. I was at the Super Bowl and doing Radio Row and just been a lot of really amazing things that have come my way. Cool. Cool. Nice. Um, brilliant. So ex NFL player. Now you're attempting the seven summits. Where are the seven summits or what are the seven summits for anyone who mightn't have a clue? Yeah, you know, that's that's actually a really good question because a lot of times it just kind of rolls off my tongue, you know, hey, the seven summits. And so um, there's a guy by the name of Dick Bass, and he was a guy that was an oil man from Texas. And this goes back about 20 years ago plus. He went on to to uh, own and buy a mountain in, in the middle of uh, Utah called Snowbird. It's a great ski resort. Okay. And so he and another guy had this brilliant idea. He was actually the CEO of Disney at the time, Frank Wells. And they decided that they wanted to span the globe and climb the highest peaks in every um, continent. So, of course, there's seven continents. And as you go around, um, the, the mountain that's coming up for me um, in next uh, April uh, in 2020 is Mount Everest. So that would be Asia. And I guess going back to um, in Africa was uh, would be Kilimanjaro. And the next year I went off to Europe. And surprisingly, the highest mountain in Europe is in Russia. And I never thought of it that way. I thought it'd probably be like Switzerland mm-hmm. or something. But it's uh, in Russia. It's a mountain called Mount Elbrus. Uh, the following year, I went down to uh, Australia and climbed uh, what I call the Fun 7, a smaller mountain called Mount Kosciuszko. It seems like you can actually only pronounce that name uh, if you've actually been there because <laughs> I struggle with that. <laughs> And then uh, next year, I went off to uh, South America. And down South America is Argentina. And Argentina has a a quite tall mountain at 23,000 feet. You know, it's a heck of a mountain. Um, Very fun. And it really tested, I think, my my, um, altitude um, uh, ability Mm -hmm. to be high without any kind of oxygen or supplemental uh, pills or anything to help me get up and down. So I did that. And then in North America, we have a mountain in Malawi. Alaska it is a mother. It's very difficult, very challenging. It throws everything at you, pretty much that ever does, with the exception of the altitude. Um, it's just under 21,000 feet uh, in, in Alaska. And then where I was this last January uh, 2019 um, was in Antarctica, climbing a mountain called Mount Vincent. So those are, those are all seven peaks. So, so basically it's, it's one mountain per year, one summit per year, is it? It is. And, and back in the day when those guys, as I told you, that kind of invented this whole idea, um, you know, they were looking for a creative way to get after it. And it was more challenging back then. Um, and they try to do it in one calendar year. And other people have come through and try to be the fastest. And, the, and you know, there's another thing also called the Explorer's Grand Slam, where you also ski to the North and the South Pole, including climbing all summits. Oh. And there's something now also called this, the, the Second uh, Seven. So, you know, people are kind of reinventing, yeah, um, yeah. you know, what to do and how to do it. <laughs> Jesus. Sounds, yeah. sounds great. Like it sounds crazy to, to somebody who, who might never have climbed any kind of a mountain. Um, I've done some like adventure races and stuff. So like bike ride, mountain run, trail run, and some time in a kayak. But like to somebody who's who's not into this, this just sounds, <laughs> you know, totally beyond well, the human being. Yeah, you know, here's the best part about it is 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 again, let's go back to why I started climbing, and the reason why I started climbing is because I was at a, a spot in my life where I was down, and I need some kind of a big goal. I need some energy to really like supercharge me to get me going again, and um. And what I've discovered now after being on eight mountains, two of them twice, um, and at this now for, you know, I think seven years is, is that, um, and you, you hear this as kind of a cliche all the time where it's, it's, it's not about the destination. It's all part of the journey. Mm. And that certainly has been the case. So, you know, traveling to Africa and being involved in, in, um, in fundraising for people in those side tribe you know building water wells and and going to russia and and experiencing the people and 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 in some of these climbing parties nationalities from all over um coming together for one singular 
um, goal mm. um, to climb that particular mountain and then just personality types. And, you know, it's just been really fascinating and, and really none of that has to do with um, summiting these mountains. I'm fortunate that I have, but it, it's uh, like, as I look back on it, it's been like, Oh, when I was in Argentina and you know, when I lessons learned, I, I learned down there and, and the people I've met and the things I was able to do and the food and the culture and all that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So I suppose that the deeper, why, like what, what's your why for, for the seven summits, your, the motivation factor, the, yeah. why, yeah, no, that's a, that's a deep, that's a really a deep question actually. And, and I, I think the answer for me is, and I'm not sure how many layers you need to go to get down to, you know, why, but I've always been challenged by athletic, um, goals and again, playing in the NFL, less than 1% of anybody who ever straps on a uniform ever gets to play at that level. And I'm so blessed and fortunate that I was, and yet again, yet to have a certain mindset to get there. And I think like what I've learned even more and more in life that when you're a kid and you're growing up, um, you're kind of thrust into all these different sports and, you know, the bar isn't set super high. And, and obviously as you go higher and higher, um, more and more people fall off. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like for me that I've really continued to be super motivated from keeping in great athletic shape by setting goals out there knowing that I've got something down the road, knowing that um, I've got something to prove probably to myself, maybe to others. Um, There's a lot of mountains that came out of there that um, I always looked up to. And I always said to myself, I want to be one of those guys. And um, we are, are, are all born with certain strengths and weaknesses. And my strengths happens to be going up a mountain. Um, and I, and I'm pretty professional at it and I'm strong and, and um I don't know. It's just, it, it just, I like the, I like the feeling. I like the adrenaline that I get when I go work out. I work out now. I mean, I've literally changed my whole life. I work out twice a day. I live in Sun Valley, Idaho now, which is a little ski resort in the middle of nowhere. I live at 6,000 feet. Um, I'm up the mountain, you know, so I've really immersed myself around this because the, the, the joy and the happiness that I get and as it's turned out, and I never planned on this, is that the inspiration that people have told me that they get seeing an older guy not just saying, hey, I'm done. I'm just going to play golf for the rest of my life or drink cocktails and all that. You know, it's just that, like out still attacking life. Yeah. And that's a pretty cool feeling. Brilliant. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay, nice. So specifically then, why, why this challenge? Why, why not something else? Why, why a mountaineering challenge, I suppose? Well, again, I think it goes back to growing up in Seattle. It's something that, I mean, if you take a step back and, and I'm looking at, you know, when I was going through this tough time and I was walking around the block with my chocolate lab every night saying, like, how did I get here? And this is as I was going through this divorce and I'd moved from where I knew everybody to someplace in California where I didn't know anybody. And then after a couple of years, I just said, you know what, I'm going to stop feeling sorry for myself. This. And at that point in time, it's just like this, this clarity in my head came to me. It's like, I've got to do something athletically great. Those were the gifts that were given to me, right? So when you start going through these different stuff, I'm not a great swimmer. I'm not a great biker. I'm not a great um, marathoner, mm. you know? So, you know, we all have strengths, right? And yeah. there's just, there's just certain things. And so um, um Growing up in Seattle and living up there um, quite a bit, and even in California, um, I continue to spend a lot of times in the mountains, mm-hmm. climbing right in my mountain. It just seemed like a natural fit. Like this wasn't like like you know all of a sudden I was going to try to swim the English Channel or something. <laughs> people were said, "What? What are you doing?" Versus yeah. climbing, like okay, yeah. that, that makes sense, right? So it just seemed like that was a natural that's fit. Right. And then when I started doing some research, there's one guy, NFL guy, that's I think climbed for the seven, but he's aged out and he's no longer doing that. So it's just like, I can do this. I'm going to go after this and I'm going to be the first guy to do it. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. That's, that's as good an answer as I can get. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you mentioned you, you've done the, the seven, sorry, you've done six of the seven to date um, with yep. 
Everest being the last one. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of concern right now, and this is actually brings up a whole other topic, but you may have seen this last year. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of chaos a couple of months ago up on Everest. I don't know if you saw that iconic picture of a big long line of people trying to make it to the top. Yeah. yeah. Dangerous. Uh, and one of the guys, yeah, the first guy that, that died up there was my tent mate in Antarctica. And, um, I think I go back to that thing I was just saying, you know, really understanding your strengths and weaknesses. And um, there is no question that this guy, his name is Don Cash, who died up there. He's still, he's still sitting up on top of Mount Everest. Um, oh. That he was, something bad was going to happen to him. And, you know, and so we were kind of all hoping this thing would go away, but he was totally committed to it. And he was doing something that, you know, he just wasn't that great at. And that doesn't mean take anything away from him yeah. being a fantastic person, a dad, you know, a father, all this. But it, it just, you know, wasn't his space. And so you've got far too many people that um, that probably shouldn't be on the mountain, one. And number two is this year happened to be a very small um, uh, summit day window, meaning typically it's like 10 to 12 days where you can spread those people out. Mm. And this got compacted down into maybe two days. Okay. And that's where the kind of rubber met the road. Mm. And so a lot of people have been reaching out to me saying, please don't go, you know, we were fearful for you. And, and I just have, I just really, I respect the mountain, but I don't fear the mountain. And I am very confident in my abilities. And I've in the industry or one of the top guys to help take me up there to the top and make sure that I'm safe and I know my limitations and, you know, knock on wood, the same thing won't happen next year. But, you know, this was kind of a one-off year where there just was that log jam. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that obviously that's not going to happen next year, but you know, that we're going to be able to navigate our way around that. Mm. Hopefully it's, hopefully they can span it out in some way, kind of regulate the, the amount of people or something. That's absolutely, you know, it's, it's human life. That's, at stake at the end of the day well yeah and and it is and so um i guess the way i look at it is roughly there's three percent people every year over over all these years of people that every single time they go up there three percent of the people die mm. right and so what i really am focused on is the 97 percent that have yeah. made it yeah and that's going to be me. And so I say, I ask myself, okay, what can I do to increase my odds, make sure I'm in that 97%? Yeah. One is I moved to a, a small town, moved my whole life to a small town at 6,000 feet. I'm in the mountains. Number two, I train like a mother. And so there may be other guys up on that mountain that are as conditioned as I am, but there's not going to be anybody up there that'd be more conditioned than me. Right. And then the next thing is just pushing your certain ways when I'm going through these daily workouts, you know, I do, you know, two a day after we, I, we get done talking, mm. um, you and I, I'm going to go on a long bike ride. So I, I kind of mixed around with weightlifting, all this cross training stuff. Cool. Um, but making sure that I push myself in ways that I'm really uncomfortable so that that pain is temporary. When I get up there, I know it's going to be tough and I can push through. I have that right mindset that's going to get me from, you know, from here to there. And, and so that I end up with a successful and not just successful, but also a, a journey where I'm not suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, you all, you always suffer, but there's kind of a good way to suffer and there's a bad way to suffer. Yeah. And, yeah. um, when we were on, uh, in, in, um, in Vincent, you know, we ran into some, you know, problems on, on some day and not for myself, but from others because they hadn't conditioned right and they weren't ready and they didn't really know and understand how to operate in the mountain when you're in stress okay. talking about, you can be hurting, but you know, if you're so well conditioned that when you're sitting there, you can like, you can, your mind's still working in the right way that you can function and, and make the right kind of decisions. Okay, cool. So that kind of brings me on to the next question. What's, what has been your, your biggest challenge, I suppose, in, in the training for each of the summits or was there any one particular summit in, in training that presented a challenge for you? For sure. I mean, I think like, like anything, I'm, I'm glad I did it this way and I got the right kind of advice. Um, and that was, um, you know, my, my, my physical and my mental state are they're they're, you know, I've always prepared well. And, and so that's always been a plus. 
what I didn't realize um, mountain climbing is a couple things. Number one, um, as you get higher and these mountains get more complex, um, the equipment, and it's so important that you have the right stuff. And it may seem trivial, but if you're sitting there and it's, you know, minus 30 degrees, which it's been, and not wearing the right thing, you know, you can get frostbite really quickly. Um, the other thing, and I would say this is the biggest thing for me that I've really had to hone my game on, and that is nutrition. And so, and so what does that mean? It means having the right types of energy bar kind of food. And that becomes a challenge because you're not sitting in Dublin at a, you know, Irish bar having a Guinness and, and some, some lamb chops or something, right? You're eating things that, that can't really be refrigerated and you have to take them a long distance and you're up there in these mountains for weeks on end. Mm. And so how do you sustain that? And you get to a point too, where after you've had your, you know, hundred thousand nuts, you know, in your mouth, they just, they taste awful. You know, you just don't want to, you know, so it's just like, how do you keep it fresh? Yeah. And so, um, uh, the, 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 the irony of all this is, is the higher you go in the mountains, um, your appetite, uh, gets suppressed. And so you're actually burning more calories, but you don't feel like don't eating, feel right? Yeah. You don't feel hungry. And so, and, but the biggest thing that happens, or at least it's happened to me is, you know, crashing mm -hmm. where you're going along, everything seems to be great. And then all of a sudden you just run out of juice. And so you got to make sure that you're sustaining, um, that, and also your hydration. Hydration is is so key, at least for me. Um, and you're making snow into water, and then you know you're carrying it on your back and everything else. And it's just you're gone for, especially on summit days, you know, 14, 16 hours. And if you can imagine being on a stair mast, high places in extreme temperatures, um, and you only got a couple liters of water. So that to me is is kind of the difference of of you know, kind of training to win and climbing to win versus crashing and having, you know, then you're, you're just, I mean, we've all had that where you're so hungry, you just get famished. And then like, what do you do? Mm. Okay. So basically in a, in a nutshell, you're, you're making the training harder and you're preparing more so for the nutrition because you've learned that from the first couple of summits. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. And it was, purposeful too in terms of the way that we went about this um you know in, in my game of course i mean what i mean you you can't ever replace you know the first time you go do something now i'd climbed before but i'd never climbed at like serious altitude yeah um like in kilimanjaro is 19,333 feet and you know what that's like and the things that you need to go through and there's little tricks that you can play and and you know whenever you're going along you, you actually even though it can be quite cold um, and, and you're going straight up, um, you're actually get pretty hot. And then when you sit down, because you're in minus 30 degree weather, um, you, you know, you need to put on a jacket. Well, if you didn't know that you wouldn't know that. And you, so you want to make sure you're the right kind of jacket and it can sustain at that, that level. So constantly kind of tinkering around with my equipment and um, making sure that the right kind of nutrition and also the hydration and those three things have, you know, I think are kind of the winning combination of, of determining whether or not you make a mountaintop. Okay, cool. So just a tip for everyone again then. So your gear and clothing, your nutrition and your hydration. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, okay, Mark, we're kind of getting towards the end of this episode. Um, is there any particular challenge that you face on, on game day, on the actual summit day? Well, I think there's, there's always, you know, you're stepping into the unknown and the unknown can be weather. The unknown can be other teammates. The unknown can be natural causes like avalanches that come down on you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I always, every single mountain I've ever been on, I always get butterflies before I, I start in and then I get going. And then it's truly metaphorical, I think, in terms of, you know, like anything in life, because we all struggle, we all want to get to some place that, you know, we've never been to before. And that truly is taking those steps one after the other, the other. And I don't, I don't spend my entire time looking at the peak as I'm going up. I'm looking usually at my feet or five feet in front of me, because that's the only thing that's important. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping over crevasse, um, cracks in the snow. 
I'm understanding, you know, what rocks I need to grab onto. I've got my ice axe in my hand yeah. and I'm just have some general awareness about what's going on. Um, that's out there, you know, how I'm feeling. I always carry, um, some snack or something. I don't have to stop everybody. We can keep going. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, just be completely prepared, get jacked up and just one step after the other until you reach that top. Brilliant. Mark, if there was one tip for anybody attempting a new challenge in life, what would it be? Oh gosh, you know, I, I, I'm going to give you a, a couple, a couple of my corny um, statements. <laughs> but um, one thing I say to my my daughters all the time is, is it takes a little more to make a champion. You know, what does that mean? That mean that sounds great and it's a raw, raw thong thing, but action creates reaction. And you cannot go forward on anything unless you you step into it and really go for it. And if you want to be a champion at anything, you have to go on and beyond. I mean, back when I was playing in the NFL, I would run stairs in the middle of the night when there was no lights, there's no camera. Every single day I'm up in these mountains and I'm running up and down these things. And there's there's no cameras, there's no reporters. I'm doing it because that's what I know that I have to do in order to become that guy to be standing on top of Mount Everest, you know, and with my hands in the air, like, you know, I did this thing and I did it because I put in all the work and, and you really, I think need to love that process. Yeah. And that's what, if you love the process, if you can, if action creates reaction, you can get going in the right place. Then with that whole corny statement of it takes a little more to make a champion, mm. you look up and one day you are a champion. Brilliant. <laughs> Super. Um, okay, Mark, how can people follow your journey? reach out and maybe give you some support. Yeah, no, I'd love that. Um, so anybody can reach me um, really on my, through my website. I've got all my social channels there. Um, that's Mark Patterson, NFL.com, Mark P A T T I S O N NFL.com. I've got my social channels there. Uh, Mark Patterson, NFL, uh, Instagram, um, all the other places, Twitter, and um, I've got a quite a, uh, a big uh, Facebook following, almost two, almost three hundred thousand now on Facebook, um, and that, that is NFL Two Seven Summit. So again, all that can be found on my website. I yeah. interact with everybody, love to talk to you, and uh, you will be able to follow my journey. Brilliant! And for anyone listening or watching, we will have this in the description um, also. Uh, so thanks a million, Mark Patterson, for coming on the Bootcast. Love it, love it. And to all my uh, Irish buddies over there, I love it. I plan to have a return trip and maybe we can get together and have one massive party post Everest. Maybe, I'll have a Guinness waiting for you. I love that, I love that. <laughs> okay, cheers, Mark. Take it easy. All right, buddy. Okay, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem, okay. thank you.